I'm gonna read this off my computer and I'll put the references for more info in the corner. So you can buy VR headsets now and you can also do some fun and a few useful things with AR on your smartphone, but why do people keep talking about it like it's the same thing? Well, your phone can see the world and put stuff in it, so put that hand computer on your face. You can see the real world, you can have other stuff you see added to the world, or you can fill your whole view with other stuff, like see reviews for a product and if it's cheaper online. See what paint, flooring, and remodel options look like in your house. Take over your whole view to have a movie theater anywhere. This is what Paul Milgram et al. called the reality virtuality continuum in 94, which is also where we get the term mixed reality. One way to do it is to put cameras on the front and show what they see on the screen. Then you can add stuff like content and filters. The term immersion is the degree to which your senses are presented with substituted information. Presence is the degree to which your brain is accepting its sensory information as reality. You'll also hear the term XR, which came from the Kronos group combining the V and A to make an X for open XR, but it also served as a kind of fill in the blank X. I'll probably start calling this stuff digital eyewear more because it's a lot more self-explanatory and avoids the misnomer of reality. The buzzwords are irrelevant because the point is you have access to all of human knowledge with the internet and digital eyewear that can show you anything, so you can imagine a lot of use cases. As others have stated, we have a bunch of black rectangles sitting around in our lives. There's computer monitors, phone screens, and TVs just being black spaces when they're not on, but TV shows and applications could be put anywhere with digital eyewear. Essentially, when you get to the point of a capable enough headset, then other screens become kind of obsolete. Besides that, they can show you not just flat rectangles, but 3D content, which enables access to all kinds of entertainment, knowledge, and productivity. One device is cheaper than three, and tuning out or disconnecting is as easy as taking them off. But you know, taking a technology to some natural conclusion in your head goes a lot faster than real life. You can think about 3D printers and naturally arrive at full object replicators capable of creating everything from nanobots to hamburgers to themselves. And so we get these hype curves where everyone gets excited and then it takes longer than two years to happen so they write it off, but the tech keeps trucking, becoming more useful and working its way to normalcy in our everyday lives until we don't even notice it. And so it is with headsets. Between my last video and now, consumer headsets came out with a lot of focus on gaming. Headsets are entertaining, next they become more useful. As the number of use cases for training and tools slowly goes up, price slowly goes down, and over decades, headsets become a totally normal thing to use while you're choosing landscaping or buying furniture. Eventually, you're not weirded out to find it in your airplane armrest, because of course you could watch movies, play games, or learn how planes fly. As a designer in this space, my responsibility is ideally to make every interaction so obviously natural that no one has to explain it to you. While it might seem like doing that for headsets is new or hard, Principles and processes of design are pretty universal because we're usually designing for humans. So we can break down our experience to more atomized principles of sensation. So like, here's a line, and here's another jaggy one, and a scribbly one. Well, this one feels kind of messy, and this one feels kind of angry. Just the curve of the line has a little feeling it communicates. Color is another kind of atomic element for design. If you paint a room yellow versus dark green, you're just gonna feel like one is more bright and happy, probably too much so to live in every day. Another's motion, which circle is excited? Well, I mean none of them, but this one's moving like it is. These atomic principles and others naturally continue in 3D space where your lines and shapes become 3D forms. Each of these has subtle feelings or impressions associated with them. Lighting gives even more cues for how to think and feel as does spatial arrangement. But those are just aspects of visual design. You have several more senses that we apply the same thinking to. For audio, you know how differently songs can make you feel. Breaking sounds down to individual elements results in similar design thinking. The timbre of a sound effect will cause a different feeling. Systems with haptics like vibration and controllers make touch another sense to design for, but one of the even more unique ones to headsets is that you can use people's proprioception as one. That's your sense of your own body position and where your limbs are. Curling up in the fetal position has a pretty different feeling than standing with your arms out. When designing hardware and software experiences, proprioception isn't just something to be aware of, but another tool in your belt that you can use to affect how the user feels as our material properties like iridescence and specularity. When you think about different disciplines of experiential design, 
architects, automotive product, interior, fashion designers, they all think about how these lines, colors, shapes, forms, spaces, motion, audio, lighting, body positions, and so on, are all ingredients that contribute to the recipe of a feeling. You should actually try first to design to get the information across with as little feeling as possible. Typography is the classic example where you can write the same thing and have it feel pretty different because of the font. You'll never totally get rid of it, but we can try to just get stuff across without emotion. Helvetica was created mostly by Max Meininger as an attempt at a typeface that doesn't make you feel anything, just communicates the information. Similarly, when the Department of Transportation needed consistent symbols in 1974, AIGA created pictograms that simply and quickly just communicate the information. That's why this is now referred to as the Helvetica Man. It's just what stuff is most easily recognized and used in a matter of milliseconds. Applying those same principles to computer screens, we could look at an operating system's mouse cursor. It's a tilted arrow because Doug Engelbart noticed it needed to be easier to find, and it remains a communicative, recognizable, high contrast shape. But if you're making a game like Dota, maybe you'll make the cursor match the visual aesthetic of the world because it's appropriate for the brand. If there's a couple options, you can figure out what communicates fastest with testing, like with the phone number pad. Moving from a rotary phone to buttons in 1960, Bell tested a bunch of layouts, and this one just happened to be the fastest, which is why you've seen it the same on phones ever since. This talk at OC6 showed a similar approach to testing abstracted input options for hand tracking. You just find which one's fastest and most accurate. You can do the same for multiple kinds of text input. For an example of honing interaction and visual simplicity, let's look at this kind of ballistic teleportation. For a little design anthropology, this comes from Unreal Tournament, where you could throw a translocator to teleport to. Budget Cuts adapted that concept for their locomotion, and then SteamVR made the same concept in Arc with a ring where you'd land with your boundaries. This kind of locomotion was better than a straight laser because you wouldn't accidentally go too far and you could go up steps even if you couldn't see them. Like the cursor, designers might tweak aspects of it to fit in the visual aesthetic of their experience, like this one in No Man's Sky. Typically to design a more general unbranded system, we'll look at the elements and break them down to their basic parts, removing any unnecessary fluff. Things frequently start with skeuomorphism, representing a literal physical analogy, and then progress to minimalism so that the things that are left are only the elements necessary to reduce cognitive load. By following the same principles that guide design in other mediums, we can make simple, clear components of interaction for spatial computing. An early stage of visual design for 2D stuff is laying stuff out and wireframing. You have to be careful and only show wireframes to people you know will suspend their disbelief and imagine that final product. The equivalent in 3D is gray boxing, where you put shapes around without textures to see how the arrangements affect how their relationships feel. Text is one of the primary elements to start with for size, because as much as we try to get concepts across without words, reading is just so fast and clear that you're probably going to need them at some point. The angular resolution of a headset determines how big your text has to be for people to read it. The sizes of interactable things, like buttons, will depend on the input method. Head tracking, eye tracking, hand tracking, or controllers will all have slightly different accuracy, and less accurate means bigger hit areas. You might have heard of pixel-perfect design for screens. Every pixel of glyphs and stuff should line up perfectly to look crisp. Most of our stuff's always moving on the screen, but we can make stuff crisp using signed distance field rendering for fonts and making image assets so the number of texels matches the number of pixels for their distance. There's the idea that all interfaces should be made somehow 3D and volumetric, but even when you do that, you end up needing to put text somewhere sometimes. 3D text is cool for big things like lettering and logos, but for interfaces and articles, it really just makes it slightly less readable. Remember that the point is for the user's brain to see that silhouette, recognize the shape, and process the information as quickly as possible. For that same reason, text that's floating on no surface is just slightly less readable. Your eyes can converge on the text and diverge on the background, and you always have double vision on one of them. It's like writing on glass with a whiteboard marker, and it's part of the reason the idea of a reflected car windshield dashboard looks good in videos, but never took off in practice. So with those concepts combined, many of the interfaces for digital eyewear may look a lot like our 2D ones, but introduce the useful aspects of depth to become a kind of 2.5D. If you're designing something within a window or frame with depth, your user's view is actually a frustum. A vertical scrolling interface becomes kind of an elevator shaft. Shadows have been used in 2D interfaces for a while, but in 2.5 or 3D, they're super important. Buttons and panels near each other should cast shadows, and edges that touch should get darker, like ambient occlusion. 
The reason is that depth is another tool for you now to communicate subtle relationships and in information hierarchy. And 3D stereoscopy alone gets you part of the way, but shadows really seal the deal to the user's brain, telling them how far apart it is. A subtle sheen of noise and textures at about the resolution of a headset is also recommendable since no real surface is perfect, and those imperfections also tell us how far away it is. As far as where to put stuff, I've talked before about how you can use ergonomics combined with the headset's properties to determine zones of comfort. I just want to add that just like other mediums, information hierarchy determines the composition. In a movie shot, you choose what's in the frame and the layout's called the composition. Similarly, newspaper layout had to determine what information was gonna be below the fold, knowing it'd get less attention. Same for websites, what's gonna be visible in the browser window at a time, considering how the eye's gonna move across the page. For digital eyewear, think about what's visible in the field of view at a time, and like the other mediums, you determine that based on the priority of the information. From watching where people look for stuff when they don't know where it is, the most important stuff goes to the front with the eyes scanning top to bottom, Second most important goes to the sides, third is down, fourth is up, and the last place people look for stuff is often their own hands and bodies. So you'd put stuff on the hands that you want to be cognitively deprioritized, like tools that don't need to be front and center all the time. It's also worth noting that we have slightly different visceral relationships to these areas around our bodies. We feel more in charge of things below our gaze and subject to things above. That makes me think we'd put things we can't normally control up higher, like weather and time. We also have proxemic relationships with distance, feeling like things are personal or public. That kind of stuff can be used for things like implying whether content is publicly visible or not. And so, similar to other mediums like theater, we have these atomic elements of spatial composition, motion, audio, haptics, lighting, typography, and so on, to use as tools in the interface design of hardware and software for digital eyewear. And again, like other mediums, we can use those to guide people toward a feeling and or goal. If a movie shot has a scene where the audience is supposed to feel a complex relationship between two characters, the production designer might decorate the set with juxtaposed materials and props that suggest that. The director of photography will light and compose the shot in a way that amplifies it. Every role from the writer to the colorist will use tools of their artistic expertise to get that concept across. If you're making storytelling or entertainment content for a digital eyewear, you'll also use those elements to get your target emotion across. If you want the audience to feel inquisitive, you might think of what layout to use in the environment, how to get the user to do a certain pose, what lighting, audio, and so on. A lot of interface design, on the other hand, is a matter of removing the emotional stuff to keep it simple and communicative, but having the tools available to draw attention appropriately and keep those nice surprise and delight moments while still being productive. The amount that you put that art back in is to serve the branding of your company or client. As you design stuff to show them, you don't have to build the whole thing out to just user test it. You can do enough to kind of Wizard of Oz it during the early stages. That's the pay no attention to the man behind the curtain thing where you just pretend they're interacting but you're actually pushing the buttons they can't see at the right time to get the idea across. When you do get to the final stages of designing for delivery, you might have to package stuff up for other teammates. Red lines are a basic way that we do that in 2D to show sizes and distances. You can do the same thing for 3D like blueprints, and I find I end up doing things isometrically a lot or from the user's point of view. GIFs from After Effects or prototypes are good for documentation and communication too. For every project you undertake, consider security, privacy, internationalization, accessibility, and diversity at every part of the process. Keyboards should be implemented in ways that third parties couldn't infer your password from your movements for security or information about your environment has to be allowed by user permission as a matter of privacy. Text should have enough space to be translated to other languages and should still work right to left. Alternative inputs and outputs should be supplied where possible. Hand tracking should work for all skin tones, eye tracking for all eye shapes, and industrial design should include races and genders. I just talked about how you have a lot of levers and knobs to tweak and affect emotions by design. When you think about theme parks, video games, art installations, or experimental theater, a lot of user experience design guides someone through a place, getting them to feel certain ways or do things without thinking. As far as I can tell, people have also been using that concept for negative or selfish purposes as long as humanity's existed. As designers of nascent mediums especially, we have a responsibility to protect users from bad agents. Every form of communication can be used for negative purposes, and there's always someone trying to game the system for fun or profit through spamming, phishing, trolling, or whatever. 
When the content can be everywhere, it's easy to see why we need ethical designers creating responsible systems that improve people's lives. And it's important to be proactively conscious because reactive is too late for some consequences. To be more specific about concerns that come up for digital eyewear, some things like living in an ad-infested dystopia are hopefully less likely because people would reject it for being a bad experience. Issues over what content is allowed at a location may be solved with permissions set by the literal owner of that physical location. Face tracking comes up sometimes in relation to headsets because an opt-out central face tracking database would obviously be unethical, but an opt-in one or an on-device user-created one might be more okay. Either way, legislation might be necessary to stop troublemakers on that one. In these cases and others, most of the time, I think it's just a matter of making it easier for developers to do the right thing for people's data security and privacy. Honestly, coming up with weird black mirror things is easy, and it's lazy to assume that tech is negative. People have assumed new technologies were inherently bad for centuries, but working to make good, ethical, responsible things that benefit humanity is work worth doing. You don't have to be a chef to know what food tastes good. You don't have to be a musician to know a good song. And you don't have to be a designer by trade to recognize when a product, space, or experience has had care and attention paid to all this stuff. The same is true for hardware and software design, and that continues with digital eyewear where we enable computing to become more spatial. The ability for a contractor on a construction site to see the up-to-date plan on site is more than a little useful. For doctors to see medical data in 3D is obviously beneficial for diagnosis, treatment, planning, and patient communication. Even for office jobs, blowing away the boundaries of your monitor to have more space is awesome, besides the concept of taking that further and working remotely or having a virtual office. You could walk around another country with all the signs and speech translated. You could go on a hike and identify any plant on the trail or constellation in the sky and see in the dark on your way back. We've talked about all these concepts in regards to digital eyewear and there's plenty of work to be done still, maybe a career's worth. But even when working on something else, the concepts are the same. In film, an auteur is someone who knows how to do every aspect of it. So they can produce, write, block, light, direct, act, shoot, edit, and so on. It seems daunting, but if you're getting into this, try to learn a little about every part. Work with every role. Learn to make icons, interior designs, 3D models, animation, marketing, product design, project management, audio, video. Whether you're creating a wearable device, a physical destination, a screen experience, or the cockpit of a spaceship, your toolbox and fundamentals will be universal. The job of a designer is to serve the physical and emotional needs of the user.